are. We're pen test partners, and we, funnily enough, spend our life doing pen testing. Uh, and what I want to show you are some examples of what happens when you don't do security right. And some of the tips, the techniques that we use to extract information that maybe you haven't thought about. Now, if you haven't come across this, the sort of things we're known for, probably some stuff you've seen in the press. Hacking kettles, I think we did that last year. Um, hacking smart fridges. Samsung don't like us very much, it turns out. Um, but also the Mitsubishi Outlander, which is my car. It's out there in the car park right now. Still vulnerable, still got Wi-Fi on. And we showed how you could pop the door locks over Wi-Fi by cracking the encryption key, which, which isn't ideal, really, is it? You, you kind of hope things are more secure than that. Um, not good. But what I want to show you are the techniques that we use. Now, if you look at some of the big, um, the high-profile hacks that made the press, um, the Jeep hack you all know about, the Nissan Leaf hack was great, there was a flaw in the API, and also some of the work that the Cloudflare team did on the Tesla. Now, the one that's most interesting to us was the one at the top, the Jeep hack, because our view with automotive networks, as in the CAN, or the LIN, is frankly, it's not that important. What we care about is how you get onto it and what flaws you find in the ECUs, the IVIs, and the TCUs that actually allow someone externally to get onto the CAN and then start issuing safety critical messages. So the key about this is those black boxes that you put in the vehicle, those ECUs that no one really looks at, what's inside them? What can you do and what can you extract from them? And how can you hack using information you've gained from them? Now. There's an old adage in security that by the time you've social engineered your way into a business, by the time you've got past the foal, by the time you've got past the security guards, it's all over. But the problem with IoT, with connected vehicles, is that you're giving all that stuff to the hacker already. You're selling them a car. That's their car. Thank you very much. Great. I'm going to take it apart. And we do. And I'm going to buy a kettle. I'm going to take all the chips out of it. I'm going to read them and find all the mistakes you made in your code. So it's probably about time for me to hand over to Andrew now. He's going to show you how we go about doing it. <laughs> Not quite, Andrew. Just me. <laughs> Just me first. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Ken. Thanks for introducing us. Um, so, yeah, um, the thing with IoT and with, with connected cars in general is, you know, this is a very naive view of, of, you know, you have this device, whatever it is, and, and invariably it talks to something on the internet. And as an attacker, the attacker can either attack the internet bit or it can attack the, the IoT bit. The thing is, the realistic view with IoT and with, with, with connected cars and, and connected vehicles is, is actually a bit more complex than that. Yes, you've still got your vehicle, and yes, you've still got your service it connects to, but then you've got other users of the vehicle. Then you've got network segmentation, because let's not forget, the internet is not a direct point-to-point -point connection. Then you've got the devices that allow that network to work and allow the internet to work. And you've got perhaps other people on the network that the car's connected to, the home Wi-Fi network, for example. You've got a cloud base, a cloud-connected user using the API to connect to the services on the internet so they can turn on their air conditioning in their car, for example, while the car's on their drive. You've got the administrators, your administrators. You've got networking equipment across the internet to allow the internet to work. You've got backup servers. You've got the administrators of AWS or whatever cloud service that you're using. And then you've got the attacker. And the attacker can attack lots and lots of different locations, not just the car, the, the, the cloud user, the, the, the cloud services itself, but also they could be within the internal networks, within the Wi-Fi network that the car's connected to, or within the network that the car's connected to. They could be man in the middle position between the cloud-based user and your service. They could even attack your users directly. You might even have malicious insiders in either of the organizations. And then you can also have rogue nation states who perhaps want to take over the networks that, that your cars are traversing over. And so when you start to look at IoT and look at connected cars, it's much, much more complex than just your device and your service it connects to. But when we look at tar targeting cars, one of the first things we want to try and do, we want to try and get the firmware from the device. And the reason for getting the firmware from the device is because invariably it gives us lots and lots of information. Things like the operation of the device. We can try and work out how it works. And we can use tools to manage that firmware offline. So we can run things like debuggers to try and identify vulnerabilities within the car. We can find vulnerabilities such as buffer overflows within the, within the firmware. We can also find things like hard-coded passwords, or perhaps some of your intellectual property. Because let's not forget, these things are running your intellectual property. 
things that allow the car to, to, uh, to process complex information and not crash, ultimately. But passwords is really interesting because quite often when we look at smart devices and cars and IoT devices, quite often what we find is that people will hard code credentials within them. And this is an example of a, of a device we find. And we find the, the hard coded credentials, it's a hash of the root user. And it was pretty trivial for us to then brute force that root user and then we've got considerable access to that hardware just by brute forcing that password. The problem with, with uh, these sort of devices, with firmware specifically, is developers have this view that their code is somehow hidden. No one can see their code. No one can find their code. And as a result, you find some rather amusing things in there. Um, this one here, someone's decided to write some code which ha uses the unhandled shit status for SSL. Not entirely sure what that's supposed to do. It's some kind of poor SSL communication that the developer really didn't want to work. Or this one, I really like this one. This is off a thermostat. And this is a thermostat where, where it's got a screen wiping thing, so it changes the screensaver. And, uh, and there's like three different modes, and the fastest one is son of a bitch mode, which is just brilliant. I love that. But the other thing is, you know, sometimes developers do get it right. You know, they do a really good job. And this is some really interesting code we found from a device. And what we found is that, actually, they do a really good job. They validate a password that is actually correct before they actually let someone log in, which you'll be surprised how often that doesn't happen. And so, you know, that's really cool. Except when you come to change the password, they don't actually check that the password you're putting in as the old password is actually correct. So it means that any, anyone can just change the password of any user without any validation that that user is authorized to change that password. So when we start to look at devices, one of the first things we'll do is we'll try and do some open source intelligence gathering. And the great thing about selling things in America is that you're required to register anything with a communications <coughs> device with the FCC. And they publish all of their information on the internet. So you just need to search the FCC for really cool information. So we just did a quick search here for Daimler. I hope it's Daimler in the room. Hopefully not. Um, so we did, did a quick search just to see if we could find any information on them. And uh, we just grabbed the first thing we could find, and we get loads of really, really detailed diagrams of sensitive things that you've put into your hardware. And it's free of charge to obtain this. We can also use other services like Market, for example. Market is brilliant. They do teardowns of so many, uh, so many th things. And, and you know, yes, you have to be a subscriber to gain access to it, but you can get a lot of really sensitive information. And this is, this is a great example here. We've got a really high-resolution picture of, of a particular piece of hardware. If we zoom in a little bit on this particular chip here, we've got model numbers of the chip. But not only that, this is a really, really sensitive chip that, you know, highly protected. You're not able to see, see this ordinarily. But the other thing is you can also, in a lot of cases, get schematics of how the system works. And that makes our lives really, really easy when we, when we kind of move from that, that logical approach, you know, the, the, the open source approach, to, to actually doing testing itself and examining the firmware. And I'm going to hand over to Andrew to kind of run through his bits now. So traditionally, what we've done with hardware testing is we've approached everything as a black box. We've taken a TCU, just, just an example here, a telematics control unit, and we've looked at the external interfaces. So we've got USB, CAM, Wi-Fi, and GSM. We've tried hammering it from the outside. But what we really want to do is look inside that box. And that's what Tony started looking at there, by getting that um, diagram to see what was inside. So what we can do is we can break it down. So we've got the flash. So that's like the hard drive of the device. So we can get the firmware from there. If we can take the firmware from it, we can also reprogram firmware back onto it so we can modify the firmware. <clears throat> In terms of UART, that's a serial console. Nearly all um, Linux-based devices just have a serial port to allow you to connect to them. Quite often, that just allows us access to the OS straight away. The RAM, the RAM's great. Most things encrypt data, so they either perform SSL the S in HTTPS, or they store secret keys. If we can access the RAM on that device, generally those keys will be available, and that decrypted information will be in the RAM. The thing down there, JTAG. JTAG is a debug interface, and that allows us to recover the firmware, recover the RAM, and also get debug access to the device. So what we're taking is black box testing to what we call gray box testing. 
Now, it's important differentiation between different types of device. This is a Beagle Bone Black, which is just like a Raspberry Pi, a small computer. And this uses what's called uh, a microprocessor. So that's the red box here. And external to that, we've got the flash memory here in green and the RAM. They're separate packages. So what that means is we can intercept the signals going between them. And that makes attacking the devices far easier. This is an Arduino Uno. Now, this uses a microcontroller. So that means that everything is integrated in this much smaller package here. So that means we can't access the flash memory so easily. Um, what we're finding is automotive is moving from microcontrollers through to microprocessors with external flash as things are getting more powerful and more complex. So we can perform a lot of attacks with this. Um, these, these are actually 555 timers, but these represent the kind of packages that external flash memory is quite often in on these devices. So you can see they've got pins around the edge, and those pins mean we can access that memory and read it. The way we do that is with a small test clip. So it's just a, a 10 pound clip, and it just fits over the outside of the chip, and it allows us to read the memory. This is just an example of me doing it to one other board. I'm going to show you how we do it live here. Um, hopefully, it will vaguely work. So what we've got is we have a beagle bone, which is, oh, yep, sorry. Go to the presentation. I just need to get around to the right display. There we go. What we've got is, it's called a beagle bone black, and it's just like a Raspberry Pi. And what I can do, I've got a target device here, which is essentially, it's a digital video recorder. Um, the reason we've gone for a digital video recorder um, is they're actually very similar to a lot of automotive components. Um, we've got the main processor here in the middle. We've got the RAM to the side of it, and the flash chip's actually on the other side. So I'm just going to turn it over. And you can see this large chip here. It's got 16 pins instead of eight, is the flash memory. All we have to do to get a read off that is take this test clip, clip it over like this, and then we just have to run a bit of software. Which hasn't worked here, but that's fine. Um, what we can do is we confirm the firmware that we've read is genuine. So we're just going to take that file that's been read from here onto that device. And we can just scroll through it looking for strings. And you can see we've got normal strings there. We know we've got a good firmware read from there. So that's just one way of pulling firmware off one of these devices. But we've got another technique that's quite helpful. Uh, it's what we call glitching. I'll just jump back to the slides. So with glitching, generally these things, they perform a bootloader stage, then they load the kernel, which is like the operating system, you get a console. Now with this particular device, that doesn't work, it just stops. I'll show you how that happens. So what I'm going to do... You need to drop out yep. the presentation. I'm just going to boot this DVR. We're connected to the serial console on it. And you can see this output going past. So at the moment, we've got the bootloader. It's going to take a few seconds, and it's going to say kernel loading, and then it's not going to give us a console. So we can't really do much with that. We can't log into the device, and we can't get the firmware. But there's ways around that. What we can do is if on the data line of the memory chip, if we pull it to ground at exactly the right moment, the device can't load the kernel. If the device can't load the kernel, it drops us back to a prompt, allowing us access to the memory. So it's really simple the way we do that. I'm just going to flip the board over again. All I'm going to do with the multimeter is I'm going to short the data pin on that chip, and I'm going to short it to ground at exactly the right moment, and hopefully we should be dropped to a console. It doesn't always work, but we'll give it a go. So we should be able to see both things at the same time. This requires several hands. I should teach Tony to do these things, shouldn't I? <laughs> so I've just turned it off. I'm going to turn it back on again, and then at the right moment, I'm going to short the data pin there, give it a second or two, and now you can see on the serial console here, it says, can't get kernel image, and we've been dropped to this high silicon prompt. 
Now, if I do md.b0100, I can dump the first 100 bytes of flash memory off the device. Now, this can be done on so many of these things. It's really, really easy. It's really, really common. And when we can't access the firmware by clipping on, it's a very easy way of getting these things. So we talked about JTAG as well. Now, JTAG stands for Joint Test Action Group. What that really means to you is it allows us access to the flash, the CPU, and the RAM of the device. There are ways of securing it. But what we do tend to find is that sometimes it's difficult to find JTAG pins. It's a hardware interface. So we need to find pins into the device to access it. It can be really easy. This is a USB uh, modem. Um, we open it up, and we quite quickly see these series of test pins. That shouts JTAG to me. And indeed, on this, they were JTAG pins, allowing us access to the firmware running on the device. However, we move back to our DVR. JTAG's not obvious on here. We can't see where the pins are. We went through everything exposed, and we couldn't find anything. So we can reverse engineer the PCB. What we want to do is we want to take all of the components off it. We want to see the traces on it. The way we do that is with a toaster oven. <laughs> So these are about 30 pounds on Amazon, so they're, they're not expensive. Um, it's probably not the most finesse technique ever. Um, but I literally put the whole PCB in the oven, heat it up to the melting point of solder. When it's done, I give it a really, really hard whack on a piece of wood, and all the components fall off. We end up with something that looks a lot like that. So it's a bit messy at the moment, but we can start to see the traces. We can see how everything's connected together. They're still not that clear. So what we can do then is we can sand the board away. So we can use wet and dry paper, and we change that green, like that, into lovely clean copper. We can scan the board in. This is just with the normal flatbed scanner, and we're actually getting a good level of detail now. We can post-process that, and we end up with this lovely image. And this is just brilliant. All I've done is I've used the fill tool to trace the tracks on this. So we knew where ground was, so we filled the whole ground plane with green. We know where USB is from the ports, so we fill them with purple. We know that the RAM chips are here, so these blue traces of RAM. These, I can't remember what they are. This is out to a video coprocessor. The yellow ones are HDMI. And what that's allowed us to do is isolate certain pins off this chip. And it's got 400 odd pins on it. So without this, we wouldn't really know what we were doing. We wouldn't be able to find these JTAG pins. Um, it's still quite a long and involved process. Things get more complex, though. Some devices have multiple layers. This actually has four layers, this board. We don't really care about the inner layers. The two outer ones give us nearly all the information we need. But what we're starting to use now is x-ray. Um, this is just the kind of x-rays they use for inspecting assembled devices. So here, this is again looking through um, a BGA package. So you can see all the balls, and you can see where the traces are going. Now, it takes time to decode this, because you don't know where everything is. Um, you can see how complex this can get. This is a modem out of a TCU. Um, so it's got four significant sized BGA packages that are of interest. It's got 10 layers on that tiny board. So it's a lot of work to reverse engineer something like that. But we will find it. Now, in terms of getting that, once you've got that firmware, we want to turn that into a file system. And this used to be really, really complex. So you have this binary file, and you have to manually work out what's going on. But because hardware hackers are getting so involved with this stuff, um, what we've started doing is using a tool called Binwalk, and I'll just show you how simple that is. What Binwalk does is you provide it with a binary file. Well, wow, it's a lot there. You provide it with a binary file, and it will extract the file system using signatures. So it will just look through, looking for certain words, and it will see that right at the beginning of this file that I pulled from a camera here, it's got a thing called a YAFS file system, which is a common embedded file system. It goes through and it finds all the other strings and things there as well. But the end result of that is we end up with a directory structure. So if I go into app here, we've got all the binary files. We've got all of the scripts that run this device. So we've pulled them off a camera from the physical chip, and now we've extracted them. We can now examine them and look for bugs. Now, I talked about microcontrollers and how they've got everything integrated into them. What that means is it's more difficult for us to access that flash. Um, there's a thing called code readout protection, CRP, that stops you accessing it. So the attacker comes along, 
and you don't want him to get in. So what you do is you set the JTAG fuses. So you, what a lot of people assume is this means you've locked JTAG. What we found in reality is that lock doesn't actually apply to the JTAG. The lock applies to the path between the JTAG and the flash. So we can't read the flash, not directly. We can work around that. If we write some simple code, maybe a bit more complex than this, that just reads the flash memory, copies it into a register on the CPU, and keeps on doing that. So what it's doing is it's copying the flash into the CPU one word at a time. We can load that into the RAM of the device, because JTAG still allows access to the RAM. The CPU will then execute that code, which will copy the flash into the CPU, and then out via the JTAG, and the attacker's got the code. This is incredibly common. We've got tens of different bypasses for different chips, and the number of times we've seen vendors just say, how did you get the code? And it's like, well, we're tricky guys. We know these things. <laughs> so why would we want to do this? And this is just a really quick example of why we want to get access to firmware. When we look at TCU, all we see is a connection going out somewhere. It's sending its telematics somewhere, and things are coming back to the car, but we can't see anything else. We want to climb inside that black box. And what we see inside that black box first is a GSM modem establishing a connection out. Inside there, you've got the point-to-point -point daemon, creating a mobile connection, an APN connection, out to an APN. So that's how the data is getting out, and we can now see that. Within there, we've got SSL, so that's the encryption as part of HTTPS. That's actually going out to another server entirely. And then within there, the telematics client is sending its request through to that telematics server. And this is great. This allows us to understand the plain text telematics communications by breaking into this box. But it gets even better than that. Sometimes it can have wider implications. What we found recently is that an attacker can actually access other servers through that APN that's on the internal network. Um, that can have serious implications. But the end result of all of this really is these kind of hacks where people take over cars. And I think I'm going to pass back to Tony. Cool. So yeah, there's a lot of things that we can do once we've got the firmware. But I guess the, the key thing really for you is you know, how do we go about kind of fixing that? And, you know, I think the first and most important thing is you really need to assume that your firmware is not secret. Um, people can gain access to your firmware. And so, you know, the thing to be aware of is, you know, we all expect that you will have vulnerabilities. Everyone should understand and realize that they will have vulnerabilities. You need to have the ability to fix those vulnerabilities. And I think I talked about this last year, you know, having the ability to remotely update your systems. Um, you'll be surprised how many cars claim to have the ability to remotely update their firmware, but not everything. And it's very important you have that ability to do that. Um, there's also, you know, don't just rely on code uh, protection because we can bypass that, code readout protection. Of course, we can bypass that. The other thing, you know, I said it last year, I'll say it again this year, OWASP and the, uh, the IoT Security Foundation, the outside there, they will help you with defining the best practices for, for your systems. Um, if you are using outsourced developers, make sure that you've got security defined in your contracts and you've got the ability to audit that. And then finally, you know, uh, uh, you know test it. You know, it's so important to test every aspect of your systems that you're building because attackers have your code. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's pretty much it, really.